how many of you go home after a long day's work and start streaming videos on YouTube or Netflix to relax? I know I do, but did you know that just this video streaming is amounting to about 1% of the carbon dioxide emissions worldwide? After all, all our computers and smartphones are connected to these data centers, which are gigantic colonies of computers, which are continuously absorbing and processing and disseminating all the data that we generate. In the year 2021, data centers around the world consumed electricity at par with major nations like South Africa and the United Kingdom. Electricity, 60% of which is still coming out of fossil fuels. By the end of this decade, about 3 billion tons of CO2 could be dumped into an, our atmosphere just because of our computing infrastructure. And it's only getting worse from there. Based on the trends over the last three decades, we could be generating about 50,000 terawatt hours of electricity in the year 2040. But a peer-reviewed article in 2016 predicted that at the current rate of growth in AI and computing, Lord AI of 2040 would ask us to feed it about 10 billion terawatt hours of energy. And that's just crazy. I mean, where are we going to get all that electricity from? It would take 200,000 Earths to make that kind of electricity. But we cannot just stop computing to save our planet. After all, a lot is connected to computers getting better. It could be autonomous vehicles, gene therapy, finance, space exploration. What we need are greener chips. Computer chips which are exceedingly energy efficient so that we can have minimal environmental impact while also advancing human endeavors. And to do that, if we look closely at is there something wrong with our computers, we see that there is something fundamentally flawed in the hardware. And we also have a fancy term for it. It's called the von Neumann architecture. To understand what this von Neumann bottleneck is, let's Take an example. Suppose you want to build a carbon neutral co corporate space. For that, you find a barren piece of land away from the city and you build your offices. You plant a lot of trees, you install solar panels, windmills, and you get to your goal of net zero carbon emissions. But you forgot that your employees now have to drive tens of miles from the city to these offices. And whether they're using combustion engines or EVs, it is creating a carbon footprint that you did not account for. The bottleneck to your green ambitions here is the pollution caused by your employees commuting because the offices are far from the cities. And this is what is happening in our computers too. The processors and the memories are physically separated. And to perform computation, data needs to flow back and forth between the processors and the memories, and in doing so, causes energy dissipation. And this is a massive problem when it comes to large-scale data processing with complex neural networks, where billions of data weights need to go back and forth at each computational step. So much that the energy associated only with accessing the memory far exceeds what is needed for bare computation. So what can we do about this? Well, we can take inspiration from our brain. After all, the brain is enabling human uh, intelligence with just 20 watts of power. And although we are far from completely understanding how the brain works, what we do know is that its processing units, which are these neurons, are directly linked to thousands of synapses, which are its dynamic memories. And by forming this intricate network, the brain is able to keep the von Neumann bottleneck at bay. And the brain is also not fussy about being accurate at every computational step. It allows mistakes here and there to stochastically get to the correct result. And in doing so, saves a lot of energy. So to mimic the brain's strategy for low power computation, we need to make a network of artificial neurons and synapses with material systems and underlying operating principles which can be seamlessly integrated. And to do this, our group is making use of magnets. And why not? Magnets are very attractive. Magnets are an ideal material system for enabling memory storage, energy efficient switching, and harnessing stochasticity. 
Magnetic memories are non-volatile. What this means is, after writing data to these memories, you can stop powering them, and they will still retain the data. This is unlike conventional charge-based memories, which need to be continuously powered for them to retain their data. And then about the processing units. Well, processors at their most fundamental level are a bunch of switches. The switches in our brain are the neurons. The switches in our computers are what we call transistors. Turns out if you make these switches with magnetic materials, the task of switching can be performed hundreds of times more energy efficiently as compared to a CMOS transistor for the same error rate. And that's because the state of a magnet is a collective effect of its constituent electron spins. And these spins are strongly correlated so that when you spend energy to flip a few of them, a whole bunch of them go along. By making the magnets extremely thin, we can use voltages to switch them, and that allows us to get the high spatial resolution and minimal energy overhead that we desire for switching. And so we go to the thinnest possible magnets there are, two-dimensional magnets. Then by making these two-dimensional magnets smaller even laterally, we can introduce stochasticity in their switching. And finally, we can mimic the brain's strategy for low power dissipation in our brain. Based on ongoing experiments, we can estimate that our 2D magnetic neuromorphic devices would consume up to 100 times less energy as compared to their CMOS transistor-based counterparts. And projecting these device-level gains to a system level for, say, solving an object recognition problem would allow up to 10,000 times lower energy consumption. But then our work is rethinking how our computers are built at the most fundamental level. And hence, its impacts can be far-reaching. These devices are not built for one single use case, but they can allow energy reductions everywhere from computers and smartphones to autonomous vehicles and data centers. In edge devices like smart wearables and remotely deployed sensors, which are working on strict energy budgets, they can give the ability to perform tasks which would otherwise be impossible. And there are challenges to making this a reality, but when we get there, those 3 billion tons of CO2 we talked about in 2030, those would almost completely disappear. This was ENIAC. It was the first general purpose digital computer. It contained 18,000 vacuum tubes and took up 1,800 square feet of space. But we loved it, and we wanted computers everywhere. The big issue was that they were just taking a lot of room. So those folks in the 70s, they got into this mind-blowing race of making a computer chip smaller and smaller and smaller, and that race has continued for five decades now. This year, Apple introduced their M1 Max chip. It contains 57 billion transistors in under a square inch of space. That glorious race has largely enabled the science and technology of today. I hope that 30 to 40 years down the line, people will say, those folks in their 20s, they noticed the energy dissipation problem in time, and they got into this crazy race to make our computer chips extremely energy efficient. And that has enabled all the AI and computing advances without hurting our planet. A lot of us here are those folks in the 20s who need to jump into this race. And with our magnetic devices, we have started running. Thank you. <laughs>